Kreisberg, home to nearly a half a million people and, until very recently, Monica Schaffer. Once a melting pot of cultural diversity, it's now a chaotic mess of wealth and poverty, crime and commerce, anarchy and control. It's also home to your own little slice of Berlin, a neighborhood that the locals call the Cruise Bazaar, a safe port in the eye of a storm. The ride back to the Cruise Bazaar is quiet. No one is in a talking mood. As the van veers past potholes and garbage piles, the glare of streetlights and neon signs plays across your window, painting the world in a kaleidoscope of garish colors. Soon, the van rounds a corner and skids to a halt in a narrow, crumbling alley. This is as far as Berlin's chaotic streets will take you. Your team wordlessly debarks the vehicle and climbs down into a disused section of the U-Bahn tunnel system, a well-kept secret providing your team safe passage into the cruise bazaar. Your safe house waits on the other side. Let's get inside. Can't happen fast enough, love. The sooner we get in, the sooner we can get drunk. Can't go that way. Let's go up. That was definitely something that needed to be shown. Someone named Paul. You step inside and the squalor of the disused Yuban tunnel gives way to the warmth of your safe house. A man waits inside, silhouetted against the dim fluorescent lighting. Something bad has happened, hasn't it? He steps forward, revealing a pale and expressionless face, light glinting off of steel-rimmed glasses. Paul Amsil, your team's fixer and landlord, part deal maker, part information broker, one of the most well-connected men in Berlin. His eyes sweep across the team as he takes it all in. The grim faces, the hard stares, Iga's fury, Monica's absence. I had a feeling. How did she... His face has gone ashen. He swallows, takes a moment to chew out the words before spitting them out. How did it happen? The run was a setup. One minute she was cracking the safe, the next she was on the ground screaming. I've seen Monica hit black ice before. This, this was something worse. Glory nods, her motions robotic and spare. Monica died of a biofeedback-induced stroke. That's right. Agar thrust a glove finger into your chest, and this idiot stood by and let it happen. Ignore it. Let it happen? She jacked in, she screamed, and she seized. By the time we saw she was in trouble, it was already too late. Yeah, because you never bothered learning what to look for. Muscle contractions and micro tremors are good indicators of a Decker in distress. I'm assuming you didn't have anyone keeping an eye out for those. No, if you had, my friend wouldn't be lying dead in a basement. Oh, shove off, Agar. We were all on the lookout for physical security, Afrit included. Throwing her under the bus isn't going to help anything. Under a bus is exactly where she belongs. Agar turns to face Dietrich. She towers over him, but he stands his ground. I respect you, Dietrich. You know that. But you don't have my training. None of you have. Monica was good. She was the best, right? But she was also overconfident. She treated the job like it was a game. Do that long enough and you're gonna get burned. Agar turns his fo her focus back to you. If you've been paying attention, you'd have figured all of this out on your own by now. You'd have known that Monica needed watching as much as that door. Enough, Agar. Amsel's voice is hoarse, his expression blank. Enough. Agar pushes ahead, heedless of the interruption. Her voice remains measured, but there's fire in her eyes. How many seconds pass between Monica's first convulsion and her plug getting pulled? Four? Five? Do you know how much damage biofeedback can do to a Decker's brain in five seconds? How dare you? You don't have to answer that. Of course you know. Monica died while you stood there and watched. This is all your f That is enough! Amsel's voice comes out in a roar, and his fist smashes down on the desk behind him. Agar, you and Afer can have it out later, but I've had enough. We need to talk action. Our client sent you into something much bigger than he led us to believe. I want to know why. Right there with you. This was supposed to be a milk run. Payback isn't the only reason why we need to find him. We saw something back there. Something that we weren't supposed to see. It's fair to assume that we are all still in danger. He pauses, rubs his temples. Agreed. And to neutralize that danger, we need to know who we are dealing with. Let us review the events that transpired tonight. The smallest detail could be important, so hold nothing back. Ow. Monica lived long enough to say a name. Schwarzschwing. I... I'm sorry, Adju. I can't pronounce these crazy German words. Monica lived long enough to say a name. Forschwinge. She fought hard to tell us. It must be important. Amsel seems taken aback. He pauses for a moment before responding. The Firewing? 
This is unexpected. You'll have to forgive me. This brings back many unpleasant memories. Gori raises an eyebrow. The Firewing. The most terrible of the great dragons. There are those who would disagree, but they never experienced the terror of living in her shadow. He glances at Glory. You're far too young to remember her, of course. But for Germans of my generation, the name Fuarschwing is synonymous with chaos, destruction, and death. The dragons of today are subtle creatures, full of patience and guile. Fuarschwing does not. After her awakening, she went on a four-month rampage that claimed tens of thousands of lies. Ansel takes a deep breath, slowly releases it. There's a haunted look in his eyes. Those were dark days. Countless men, women, and children were slaughtered, roasted alive in their homes by a creature of legend. No hope for salvation and no end in sight. It was a horror that you cannot begin to understand. What stopped her? I can't imagine that a rampage and dragon would just go away on its own. Eventually, the firewing was brought down by a man named Dr. Adrian Vauclair. Well, with the help of Luftwaffe, of course. But it was experimental weapons designed by Dr. Vauclair that finally pierced her hide. She fell in a hail of bullets and rocket fire and crashed down in the radioactive wasteland of the Sox. This event was called the Dragonfall. Title! Safe at last from the Dragon's Wrath, Germany celebrated Vauclair as a hero, our own Siegfried, a modern day dragon slayer. My own family practically worshipped the man. If the Dragonfall was important as an event you make it out to be, I'm surprised that we've never heard of it. Those early years of the Awakening were traumatic, eager, not just on a national level, but on a global scale. New species of awakened animals were being discovered daily. Within two years of the Dragonfall, the active use of magic had returned to the world, a new source of terror for bewildered public. And in 2021, the sudden emergence of orcs and trolls gave rise to yet another wave of global panic. Hey, 2021 is this year. In light of such turmoil, is there any surprise that Dr. Vauclair and the Firewing were forgotten? Dragons were yesterday's news. He rubs his temples. Again, all of this happened decades ago. To the best of my knowledge, the story of the Fire Shrink is a bit of historical trivia and nothing more. Alright, so Monica spent her dying breath trying to tell us about a long dead dragon. Agar sweeps her eyes across the group, searching for a glimmer of insight. Finally, she gives up. Any ideas as to why? Ansel's voice trembles with frustration. No, it doesn't make any more sense to me than it does to you. The dragon follows ancient history. Forshwinga has been dead and gone for 42 years. But there's one thing that I do know. Whatever Monica saw, whatever she was trying to tell us, it was important. He visibly struggles to calm himself, takes a deep breath, then slowly releases it. I will look into this and I will find answers. In the meantime, did you turn up anything else of value? The state was just a front for whatever was going on in the basement. Amsel nods. That much is clear. It wasn't a minor enterprise either. That facility took serious funds to build. And time. There was more to it than we saw. Places like that don't spring up overnight. And all in secret. The owners, whoever they may be, were none too pleased by your escape, I'm sure. What else did you find? <coughs> After everything went to hell, we were confronted by an orc in military-grade armor. He appeared to be the head of security. That is not much to go on. Do any details about this art come to mind? Any distinguishing features that I could look into? He was an older guy from one. From the sound of his voice, I'm guessing mid to late 40s. Pretty old for an orc. And he's had skin grafts. Most of his face looked like replacement material. If the grafts came from a legitimate hospital, there may be medical records. That is something. I will see what I can find out. Did you know anything else during the run that may be of value? No, that's all we've got. That's not much. Amsel nods, his face is drawn and haggard. It is thin, I agree. A basement, a middle-aged orc with skin grafts, and a long-forgotten world event. You haven't said a thing about our client yet, Paul. Are you holding out on us? Amsel shakes his head wearily. No, Efer, I'm not holding out. I am tired, and I am frustrated, and I already miss Monica. He takes a moment. I did not think to mention our employer because I did not set up the job. Monica did. His face reddens. I... I warned her. I told her not to take this run, but she assured me it would be a cakewalk. <sighs> Monica was approached recently by a man who calls himself Green Winters. He used to be a prominent activist in the F-State political scene. I never much liked the man, and I certainly never trusted him. But Monica, she would do anything for her cause, anything for the Flux State. He sighs. Winter swore that the data he was after was crucial to ensuring the future stability of the Flux. And that was all it took. 
I need to track down Monica's client and press him for information. Yes, most definitely. It is clear that Green Winters has involved us in something much larger than he led Monica to believe. When he finds out what happened on the run, he's probably going to rabbit. We need to chase him down before that happens. So we need information on Green Winters and we need it fast. There's a man here in the Kari's Bazaar, a Turk named Altug Bakzagi. Burakazi. There we go. He owns a little soy calf shop just down the way called Cafe K Kezve. This man is also a purveyor of information. I have done business with him from time to time. Why am I yawning? And you think he would know something about Green Winters? Amsel nods. When I discovered Monica's renewed association with Green Winters, I contacted Altig. One of his people has been keeping tabs on Winters ever since. As I said, I did not trust the man. Pragmatic. Sounds like it's time I pay Altig a visit. Yes, tell him I sent you. I will do what I can to dig into the information that you've uncovered already, sparse though it may be. Yay, I think karma. <gasps> There's a doggy! Its name is Dante! As you start towards the safe house door, a large four-legged form steps around the corner. Dante, Monica's dog, an enormous mongrel of indeterminate breed. A low whimper emerges as he enters the room, head hanging low. Aww. Ah, oh, shit. Dante. Dietrich shakes his head. Don't worry, boy. We'll look after you. At the sight of Monica's dog, Amsel's eyes well up. He inhales but can't quite catch his breath. He started whimpering about an hour ago. Turned into a full-blown howl. Wouldn't stop. He kept. He closed his eyes. That's when I realized something bad had happened. Looking down into those huge brown eyes, you see intelligence and sadness. He lets out a small whine and rubs his head against you. Aww. Grab Monica's bag of soy jerky treats off the table and give him one. Dante shakes the treat in his mouth, but it's clear he has no appetite for it and the jerky drops to the floor. He leans into and looks up mournfully, pressing his ribs against your leg. I guess the dog is going with you, Afer. Amsel takes a ragged breath and releases it, then a slow, melancholy smile plays across his face. Well, perhaps a part of Monica lives on in Dante. Return to the safe house when you're finished with Altu, mine friend. With a little luck, he can help us locate Green Winters and we can get to the bottom of this. He stares at the floor. And now, I think we should all take a moment. His lips tight for Monica. Dietrich turns his head at your approach. His aging face is traced with a network of faint scars, the legacy of too many fights over too many years. While he still retains a degree of strength and vigor, it's obvious that the shaman you see today is a shadow of his former self. Despite all of this, there is still an aura of power surrounding the man. He raises his bottle, offering it to you. Afer, welcome. I've got a bottle of schnapps that needs sherry, and I've got a fallen comrade to drink to. I don't drink, but I'll join you in saluting her memory. Daytrick shrugs. Fair enough, to Monica. He takes a long pull of the bottle, then locks eyes with you. Let me ask you a question, Afer. What made you choose to come to Berlin? I had my reasons. Such as, come on, boss. I'm just trying to figure out who I'm working for here. I think that I deserve to know that much. Oh, I keep yawning. A member of my old crew betrayed me. Ain't that a pisser. I can handle all sorts of things, but betrayal always makes me see red. Right there with you. I ventilated the son of a bitch before I left the Rurplex. Daytrick raises the bottle in salute, then takes another swig. The bastard deserved no less. In your position, I'd have done the same thing. So after all this went down, he decided to bail out the Ruhrplex and head to Berlin. Am I getting that right? More or less, there wasn't much left for me in the Ruhrplex, and Monica made me a hell of an offer. God. Ah, yes, Monica. Daedric raises his bottle again and then closes his eyes and takes a long drink. After the moment has passed, he returns his attention to you. But all comes back to our girl, doesn't it? So let me ask you, what was just what was your relationship with Monica anyway? I know that you two knew each other way back, but she was pretty coy about these things. Are you always this inquisitive? 
Yeah, I suppose. My life's an open book, so I guess I just sort of figure that everyone else's will be too. So how about it? Want to fill me in? We were business associates, nothing more. Well, that's her loss, Chummer. She was one of the best women I've ever known. Anyway, I've almost I've taken enough of your time, and the bottle's almost empty. Thanks for taking the time to talk. For what it's worth, I'm happy you're here with us. Daytrick takes a final pull on the bottle, then tips it forward, throwing the rest on the ground. Rest in peace, Monica. We'll miss you, girl. I hope you clean that up. What was his running? Because I keep yawning. Afer? Amps up peers at you apprehensively. His eyes are bloodshot, his expression grim. Did you get information about Green Winters? Obviously not, I haven't left yet. Taco. I'm going to ignore Agar for a bit. She can calm down. Alright, let's talk to Glory. Glory is beautiful in a wayfish sort of way. Her features are almost elvish in their delicacy, but there's something cold about her that you find slightly unsettling. What's more unsettling is her chrome. Glory is rocking a heavy load of Osiris wear. From head to toe, she looks to be composed more of plastic and metal than she is of skin and bone. In the shadows, individuals such as this are anything but uncommon. But Glory's cyberware is first generation, all of it. Bulky, invasive, practically museum pieces, this chrome was obsolete well before she was born. Afer? Glory shifts her gaze to you, but her expression is as cool and placid as always. Can I help you? Any thoughts on what we should do next? Find our missing client. Extract some answers. Beyond that, find another Decker. Monica won't be easy to replace. Best start looking now. Uh, so how are you holding up? Don't worry about me, I'm solid. You sure? You look like you're a million miles away. I'll be with you when it counts. Right now, it doesn't. So I have a question for you, Glory. Of the personal kind. I'm not big on sharing sport. Personal reasons. You understand, I'm sure. The edge in her voice tells you that she's not interested in continuing this conversation. Sure, I understand, but I still need to talk to you. Glory lets out a weary sigh. Ask your questions, but do it quickly. I have things to do. You can't have started running to the shadows much more than five years ago top, so what's with the vintage chrome? It was cheap. It gets the job done. She shrugs. End of discussion. I don't think so. I've known a lot of street sands in my time, but I've never met anyone who'd voluntarily install cyberware that old. You're right. There's more to it than I'm letting on, but I'm not interested in talking about it. I can't help but notice that you seem guarded, withdrawn. That's my problem and none of your concern. If whatever happened to you has impaired your ability to trust me, then it is my concern. Come on, Glory, talk to me. Trust is earned, and I don't know you yet. Maybe later, when we get to know each other better, we can talk. For now, I prefer you dropped it. Alright. Alright, I guess we'll talk. Uh, actually, I can play with this. No, oh, there's nothing in here. Okay. Okay, we'll talk to Agar. I can't put it off any longer. 
Edgar glares at you, and you can taste the bile in her stare. She clearly still blames you for Monica's death. Something I can do for you fearless later? Yeah, you can apologize for that little outburst that you had in front of Paul and the rest of the team. She replies to clenched teeth. You want to step away from me, eh, for right now? No, actually, I don't, unless you tend to make me leave. It's tempting, eh, for it's really fucking tempting. But no, I won't hurt you. Not unless you give me reason to. You're wrong about me, Ager. I intend to prove that to you. She stares at you for a moment, then looks away. Best of luck with that, Aper. Now please, leave me alone. Not just yet, we need to talk about Monica. Not right now, we don't. Don't push me on this, Aper. One of these days, we're going to hash this out, and you can talk what you like about the cluster fight that killed one of my best friends, but it won't be today. I seriously do not understand why she, like, sincerely believes that I could have done anything to help her, because it was literally just immediately fucked. Like, I pulled the wire from her the second that was given to me. Alright, let's go to the streets. I see these shiny things, and I think, like, ooh, it's a, a thing. I can go and, and loot it, but no. The dwarvish tech vendor smiles at you with practice ease, her almond eyes twinkling with the glare from a dozen tread screens. She speaks in a clipped, heavily accented German. Welcome to Data Haven. Can I help you with something? I need some tech and I want to take schedule. Show me what you've got. Cyberdex drones, outfits, consumables, programs, nothing for me. That's where I need to go, so I will not go there. Because, as I've said before, the way you play RPGs is you ignore the main plot for as long as you can. Oh, you're a handsome fellow, aren't you? Before you stands a troll, though it is a stretch to say he is standing at all. His great mass is barely held upright by two vintage prosthetic legs, along with a crutch under one arm. His body clicks and hums with every shift of his weight. Despite these disabilities, his eyes are sharp and calculating. I know you. Haven't been here long. New to the crowds bazaar then. Heard Monica had some fresh meat in her stable. Uh, there's something you should know about Monica. Something happened to her on the run. How'd you know? It was written all over your face. I had a feeling besides. Monica almost always comes around after a run to check on everybody. She's long overdue, and now you here you are in her place, so she's either severely wounded or outright dead. Dead. The grizzled troll nods grimly. The servos on his prosthetics complain as he lets loose a heavy sigh. Now that is a shame. She was a hell of a runner, that one. And a good friend. I'm Afer, by the way. Good to meet you, Afer. Name's Alexi Lane. What's your place in the Cross Bazaar? No place, really. Just an old relic, rusting away. I'll leave you be. A little Samuel. At the sound of your approach, the orc turns to face you. He wears a severe expression, but there's kindness in his eyes. He's a very handsome orc. Guten Tag, elf. Can I help you with something? I couldn't help overhearing your conversation. I take it that you run a charity of some sort. He nods. Yeah, it isn't much, but we do what we can. Such as? Give me specifics. He clears his throat, then begins to count off on his fingers. In the past several years, I have established a shelter where the dispossessed could sleep, a soup kitchen to feed the hungry, and a library for the people of Cruz Bazaar to better themselves. It isn't much, I admit, but it's a start. A good start, Samuel. You mustn't be so hard on yourself. There are limits to what one man, even a determined man, can accomplish. This is true. He nods to the Ark at his side. Thankfully, some of the residents that I've helped over the years have come back around to help me. I've got 15 assorted orcs and trolls from all around the cruise bazaar working with me now. They help me man the soup line, stock the library shelves, and to do all of the hundreds of other little things that a community organization needs done every day. These extraordinary individuals are living proof that what we do here has value. They are my inspiration to continue forward. She beams at the compliment. From her body language, it's clear that she idolizes Beckenburg. Now, do you have any more questions? If not, I will bid you good day. I don't wish to sound self-important or rude, but there are many pressing matters that, de that demand my kind. 
Fifteen assorted arcs and trolls. Does that mean that other races aren't welcome within your organization? That's taking a rather narrow view of what we do. Yes, it is true that my assistants are all members of the goblinoid races. It is also true that before they accepted my help, they were thieves, gangers, and deadbeats. This is not because we were bad people. This is because most of us with goblinoid traits are feared, mistreated, and denied gainful employment by a society that hates us. I hire only goblinoids because mainstream human society has created a need for me to hire only goblinoids. The arcs and trolls of the cruise bazaar deserve a workplace where they will be treated with dignity and respect. All that being said, our services are available to all. We wouldn't turn a desperate person away, regardless of that person's metatype. Even humans, the most privileged of all races, are welcome at our door. Isn't that what the most important? <laughs> Your use of exclusionary language is telling. Even humans are allowed. I'm an elf. What the fuck do I care? <laughs> I'll reserve judgment. You're helping people, and that's what's important. He <coughs> 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 He nods slightly. Good of you to understand. Now, is there something else you'd like to talk about? I'd like to talk more about your organization. He nods. Yes, of course. Please, go on. Are you accepting donations? Yes, of course. We're actually desperate for them, truth be told. People seem more intent on taking care of themselves than they are on providing for the less fortunate. Of course, these concepts are not unrelated. As poverty rates increase, so does the crime rate. Assisting the needy increases the quality of life for all. In any event, our shelter has some basic needs that desperately need to be filled. The walls of the shelter are not insulated, and new blankets would go a long way towards keeping our guests healthy and comfortable. Ideally, we'd like to purchase some space heaters as well. With 250 yen, we could make the purchase. Whatever you could spare would be most appreciated. Okay, here's all my fucking money. Samuel's eyes widen. This is incredibly generous. Thank you, mine friend. Not a big deal, Sam. Do good with it. With this donation, we have reached our first goal. Thank you so much for your kind assistance. I'll put your contribution to work stocking the shelter with blankets and heaters. Not a problem. Please do not downplay your contribution. You have shown kindness at a time when few others will. That means something. It means a great deal. Uh, no questions. I'm just passing by.